In this lecture, we will be discussing intellectual disabilities. These disorders were previously named mental retardation. Obviously, there was a lot of negativity associated with this term. So in 2010, the United States adopted legislation which changed the description to intellectual disability. So after 2010, the term mental retardation was to be replaced by intellectual disability. And this legislation that led to this change is called Rose's Law. And again, signed into law 2010 by President Obama. Michael Godfredson is one of the leading researchers on intelligence at this time. I've listed his definition of intelligence here, but I really like his definition. So many times in your practice as a psych MP, you'll have situations where you may want to consider using IQ testing. And so it could be helpful, for example, um, it can really give us a good idea of where a person is functioning at a certain point in time. For example, if there are disparities between intelligence and grades, we know ADHD could be a contributing factor. Measuring IQ can be helpful in many instances in better understanding our patients. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot of controversy about IQ testing, and there are several reasons for this, but one of the reasons is there's been terrible misuse of IQ testing in the past. Um, back in, during World War II, there were times when, even before World War II, um, times in the United States and in Germany where they actually sterilized people who were shown to have low IQs. Um, the Nazis often did this in the early 1930s, and they started targeted people with low intellectual functioning even before they targeted those of Jewish faith. So there's been a lot of historical misuse. Um, other reasons as well involve eugenics, so that's very controversial and some scientists in the past have thought that certain people might not, should reproduce. And like, for example, if they had lower intellectual functioning, they should not reproduce because it may produce another child that's low functioning. So that's horrible and, you know, certainly not without a lot of controversy. And there's been a lot of concern over the years, how accurate they are. And are they biased? Many scientists have thought there's some bias in the in this testing. Biases among different cultures, biases at, amongst different economical groups. Measuring, measuring IQ has taken several different forms over the centuries. It began in the mid-1800s when a French physician, Edward Seguin, classified children with intellectual disabilities for training. Where you really saw intellectual testing, IQ testing, really start to flourish which was in World War I. Intellectual testing went mainstream when the Army designed tests for service in World War I when 83,500 examinations were performed on adults. A man named David Wexler, he was a corporal in World War I, and 
He worked actually as a psychological examiner and became convinced of the inadequacy of existing intelligence tests when he tested re recruits who had functioned normally as civilians but failed the Army group exams and scored very low on this Stanford Binet test, which is when it, that's the testing they used during World War War. And so Dr. Wessler um, created a newly designed test that made multiple contributions to all later tests. And his test was called the Wexler IQ test. And it tests several things. These are listed here for your information. So an example of a a component of the verbal comprehension. And there are many components. So this is just one example. You might ask um, similarities. In what way are an apple and pear alike, for example? In perceptional reasoning index, you might do things like puzzles, for example. And then working memory very similar to some of the things we do on the mental status exam. Intention, concentration, sequencing, and the processing speed index. A couple things you're looking at are visual motor coordination, motor and mental speed, visual and perceptual speed. Just a few of the things that the Wexler IQ test looks like. Sorry guys, I'm my computer is moving very slowly. Okay, so how do mental illnesses affect cognition and IQ? Well, most people, as you all know, and as you learned last semester, most people with mental illness exhibit general cognitive deficits. In some cases, like schizophrenia, the deficits are global, affecting all aspects of cognition. In others, cognitive um, deficits are specific to particular subtasks, such as poor visual spatial working memory and ADHD. In illnesses like depression, lower cognitive scores appear to be related to decreased test-taking motivation. With most mental illnesses, significant cognitive gains can be seen with treatment. So for example, we have a client who is depressed and you know they have psychomotor retardation, everything is slowing down, their thought processes are slowing, they have problems with the concentration and memory testing on the MSE. They start treatment and whether it's counseling, medication, or combined, within time you'll start to see the MSE deficits improve and their concentration, their memory all improve. And also an interesting thing about IQ and mental illness, many studies have shown that a higher IQ has shown to be a protective factor against mental illness. This slide shows Wexler's scale of IQ, that the scoring and what range you would fall in and what it would mean. And this is the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, and you'll see mild, moderate, severe, profound. And these, you know, before 2010, these terms were mild, mental retardation, moderate, and so forth, but now it's in intellectual disability. Borderline intellectual functioning, you may hear this very often in, in psych. And borderline intellectual functioning is someone that has an IQ of 71 to 84. They, however, have no impairment in adaptive skills. And what I mean, what I mean by adaptive skills is how effectively individuals cope with common life demands and how well they meet the standards of personal independence expected of someone in their particular age group sociocultural background, and community setting. 
These are some of the areas of adaptive functioning. And for a client, according to the DSM-5, to have abnormalities, the upper IQ limit is 70. And in addition, they must have delays in at least 10 of these 10 areas that are listed right here. And so if you look at mild intellectual disability, and I think these are self-explanatory, but it's important to be able to differentiate between mild intellectual disability and moderate, and especially what the outcome is. So with mild intellectual disability, these people can usually learn to live independently or maybe live independently, but with some supervision. As they age, their, their deficits do become more apparent. Um, and usually with a mild intellectual disability, you function on the sixth grade level. Moderate level IQ of 35 to 55 these adults rarely able to progress above a second grade level. They really can benefit from social skill training. They may work very well in a, um, in a work environment that has supervision and support. So many big cities have supportive employment for individuals with intellectual disabilities. It's a very nice thing. We, it can be very helpful for these clients and it can help them live in the community with some supervision. Severe IQ of 20 to 40, these clients usually are unlikely to progress beyond pre-academic skills. They may have some letter recognition, some simple counting. Most do adapt to life in community or group homes um, or with their family members. Profound is an IQ below 25, and these clients, unfortunately, will need nursing care, constant aid, and supervision. There are several behaviors that are often come with an intellectual disability. These are listed here, and one of the big things is, you know, things that I've seen over the years are they are often very vulnerable to bullying. A lot of people take advantage of them, unfortunately. They often, the intellectual disabilities have comorbid disorders such as seizure disorders, other psychiatric disorders, other um, developmental disorders, and maybe movement disorders. In one of the intellectual disabilities, Down syndrome, research has shown that clients with Down syndrome, unfortunately, are at greater risk for Alzheimer's type dementia later on in life. And what causes intellectual disabilities? About 30 to 40 percent, there's no clear reason why it happened. Etiology can be a combination of several different factors. Genetic factors can certainly play a role, and I have listed some of the intellectual disabilities that are associated with a genetic etiology. These are listed here. And there are certainly environmental and developmental factors. Severe deprivation of nutrients and social stimulation. So kids that get no attention whatsoever or kids, some of the, you know, kids in our country that, or in any, anywhere in the world, actually, that have been um, kidnapped or locked away from humans, kept in cages, all those horror stories that we hear, this can lead to severe intellectual disability, some that actually don't recover. And then listed other causes that involve the prenatal period, the delivery, and postnatal care. So these are some of the environmental and developmental factors.